This is great! I just read a tutorial online how to read in a button input, so I can actually hook it up to a clock and make the digits change. This is gonna be so much fun! Alright, the moment of truth. And... What? What the heck is happening? You've got to be kidding me. Oh, come on. You know there's a better way, right? Okay, who is that? Don't worry about that. Let me show you. Better yet, let's make a video. That's a great idea. Hello everybody, and welcome back. My name's James from Zygle Studios, and today, finally, we're back with another video, and this is a practical embedded topic. So this is not a novel problem. Um, I hope you enjoyed the skit at the beginning of the video, but this is not a novel problem. This has been happening since the, basically, beginning of the digital age. Ever since switches had digital inputs, there's always been an issue of sampling those switches at a rate where it's human intuitive. Uh, electrical signals process themselves a lot faster than we can react and process our own uh, information through our eyes and into our brain. <clears throat> so we need to account for that. And this is something known as debouncing. Um, so bounce-free circuits have been around since the 70s. And let's start talking a little bit about that to get some background on why this happens, first of all. When you're building a circuit, digitally speaking, there's still analog tendencies that you can't simply ignore. Mechanical switches by themselves are not perfect, like anything else in life. The whole point of a switch is to keep an open path to a circuit, and once you depress the switch or close the switch's path, you enable current to flow through the branch of the circuit that was separated between the open part of the switch to ground. This allows you to use that part of the circuit. The trouble is, is with mechanical switches, the mechanism to open and close isn't perfect, meaning that sometimes when you depress the switch, it doesn't always get a full on contact for the amount of time it might need to go logical high or vice versa. So this means you can see logical high more than once when you just press the switch down once from a human interaction. Now this is a problem, so how do we fix this? Well really, the idea is to basically ensure electrically that the switch can't change states quickly enough to the point where before it reaches steady state, meaning before the hand comes down on the switch, that the digital system can sample the input too quickly to change its state. And there's multiple ways to do this. But the first most obvious way to do this in hardware is to create what's called an SR latch circuit. To make this circuit, you have to have two NAND gates. The output of one needs to feed into the input of another, and vice versa. The other inputs to these NAND gates are going to have pull-up resistors to them. And there's also a switch connecting these two pull-up resistors together. If the switch is on, the upper gate is going to be one regardless of the input. And the one on the bottom drives the lower NAND gate to zero and that will then race to the other gate. The switch will move back and forth between the input and the contacts when somebody goes to press on this, but there'll be a period of time where that input won't matter because of the race between the two gates. The latch will retain its state at zero because of the zero state NAND gate that's being fed back into the output. The switch has the ability to then move freely before that period of time has elapsed and then the state can change. So now that we know the beginnings of how to create this circuit cheaply and also pretty abundantly, let's talk about why it's not really done that way anymore and how we can do it in the modern way. Back in the 70s and 80s when digital circuit design was still fairly new and the transition from analog to digital was just in its infancy, discrete designs were always preferred over let's say microprocessor designs due to cost. So that way you can get gates or transistors and mimic the behavior of NAND gates uh, in this case, to make an SR latch, or you could even buy an SR latch off the shelf, and it would be pretty cheap to put on and put into production. Nowadays, though, it's a bit different. Microprocessors, or in this case, microcontrollers, are actually cheaper in bulk than some of these gates themselves, and they're more reliable in that sense, and you have more control. And if you already have a microcontroller on a project, why would you bother buying another component to do something the microcontroller can already do? So that's pretty much why it's not used to, uh, in this day and age. But let's talk a little bit about how we can use our microcontroller to control the input so that we don't have to worry about this. And this is what's called software debouncing. There's really two approaches to this in software. There's either count-based or time-based, and one is typically used more than the other. But it really depends on your application as to which one you should choose. 
Typically, a count-based solution is a much more effective solution. Sometimes with clocks, you have to be careful because sources aren't perfect. And in order to get the right feedback you want, a more predictable thing will be your CPU's processor time or your clock ticks. So you should probably go with a count-based approach in a timer. And that's the one I'm going to show you how to do today. So let's take a look. So in the main loop, I have this is set button press called function that's checking to see if the button has been pressed. Now right here, we have the hardware abstraction library's ability to read the status of the GPIO pin available. And in this case, I know the button is hooked up to GPIO A0. So if we read A0's state, we could immediately, like we saw in the first example in the skit, just return true. But in that case, it would be returning a ridiculous amount of trues and it would cause it to change state so quickly. This is because the processor is running at about 170 megahertz, meaning that at any given time, well really, instructions can be flowing through the system at about 170 million times per second. So we don't want that to be sampling and sending our I2C messages to the clock peripheral that quickly because it's going to change too fast and in some cases you might not even be able to see the change really. So what do we want to do? We want to slow this down. So we'll create a global variable called debounce counter. We'll increment it every time we get a true result back. And once it gets over 70,000, the counting value, we then return true. Otherwise, we'll return false. And then once we hit that value, we'll set it back to zero. So when it happens again, we can recount. Now, basically, 170 million instructions per second on a 170 megahertz clock isn't really realistic. There's a lot more overhead in a processor in this case, but we can give it as a general idea. So 170 megahertz divided by 70,000 is roughly 2428 times. So this means that per second, roughly about 2000 hertz is the sampling rate of this button. And since I squared C sends the messages out in order to change the buttons at a decent rate, this gives just enough time for everything to seem a little bit more intuitive and certainly much, much less mad. It feels more intuitive, it's more gratifying, and it's clearly represented by one button push. If you can move it up once and then hold it down and have it keep going up, it's certainly a much better system than it was before. It's time to test it. Let's take a look at this. And as you can see, as I'm pressing the button here, we're able to move the clock up just by one digit. And this is exactly what you want out of a clock. This is certainly a heck of a lot better than the previous system. As you can see, that's a much better result. Uh, you can see clearly what's going on, and it's clear intuitive feedback to the user. And outside of basic switching worlds, what type of circuit do you think maybe needs to have this same thing done as well? It's not far from what we talk about all the time. How about video game controller input? Things like the analog stick and these buttons certainly have electrical switches on them that tell them whether or not they're on and off and you need to sample those in software or create some hardware circuitry that is able to give you the response time and propagation delay that's needed in order for the software to be intuitive enough so the user can actually have a pleasurable experience when they're using the controller. This is certainly a real life application and one that hits pretty close to home at least for this channel. I hope you enjoyed this video. Like I said uh, in my community post, I'm in graduate school now along with my full-time job, so a lot of my free time is sunk into staying up to date on graduate projects, assignments, and exams. Uh, but I figured I'd throw this out as a video because this is actually a topic we covered in class and something I've done in industry as well. Uh, debouncing is nothing new and it's not going anywhere. So I figured it might be a good topic for a video. Please drop a like if you enjoyed the video and subscribe if you can, it helps me greatly. And if there's any other topics you want me to cover, please let me know. This is James from Zygo Studios, signing off.